Yeah. Okay, great. Yes. Um, perfect. So, um, okay, so uh, we talked about volcanoes. Now we're talking about um, a related phenomenon in that it's a, it's a surface geology and deep geology of the earth phenomenon. So these are earthquakes. Um, again, because of my uh, delay, we'll, we'll probably just start this this week, but I um, wanted to start off with talking about earthquakes. Actually, let me first ask, so has anybody here um, not experienced an earthquake? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's sort of the norm for we Californians. Um, years ago, when I was first uh, uh, first moved to UCLA to start grad school. I was I was TAing this. Uh, I don't even know what it was. I guess it was must have been um, marine ecology class. I, I can't remember what class it was. Anyway, um, so I was doing or maybe it's maybe it's intro bio. I think it was intro bio, and um, uh, we we're doing a review session. So UCLA has a lot of uh, large buildings, right? So it can't spread out like some campuses. So when it builds, it typically now builds up. So we were in the, I don't know, sixth floor or something like that of this, of this uh, building. And, um, I was diagramming a, a, uh, um, uh, parts of a crab and it was a review for the, there was a test the next day or the day after that or something like that. So I was, I was, uh, facing the, chalkboard we didn't have whiteboards back then we had chalkboards and i was um uh, sketching out the part of the crab and i would you know draw the gills and i would sit there and go what's this with my with my face to the chalkboard and the students would uh, you know say gills and i'd write gills and i'd go and you know, we kind of work our way around the anatomy of all these invertebrates so i was doing that as i was doing it we had a little bit of an earthquake not big earthquake but you know earthquake shake 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 for couple seconds and then uh gentle rolling shakes and then um and then it it died down and so i uh so, okay cool you know whatever that, that's uh earthquake and so i just kept going so i was like you know what's this claws and you know da, 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 work away around so i spun around and uh then we went on to the next exercise and there was maybe like i don't know 15 20 students there and they're all taking notes and they're like okay yeah whatever gills and you know blah, blah, blah. And then there's these two ladies, these two ladies that were in the back and their eyes were just big as saucers. And they were like, no, no, we're, we're writing, just like sitting up super straight. You know, everybody else is hunched over with the nose, sitting up super straight. And, uh, and uh, I'm just sort of talking. And then after a little bit, they kind of like, you know, turn, they look at each other and they kind of say something to each other. And then, you know, one lady raises her hand and <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, you have a question? She goes, uh, was, did we just have an earthquake? And I said, oh yeah, but it was, it was a small one. And she went, oh my God. She's like, should we get out of the building? Should we get it? And, um, and, you know, so I, I realized what was going on. So, you know, talked to her, calmed him down. Um, and I said, you know, absolutely. If you guys want to leave, you guys can totally leave. It's all good. This is a voluntary review session. And the two of them like, okay. And they stood up and they just, they just so uh, they were from the Midwest somewhere. Those, those two young ladies that had come out to California for school. So they had never experienced earthquakes. So it was, that was my most dramatic example of people that have experienced earthquakes and people that hadn't. And ever since then, before I started talking about earthquakes, I, I try to remind myself to make sure I, I make sure we've all experienced this phenomenon because it's very, very common, but those of us from other parts of the, of the country or world maybe have not experienced them. And, and they are pretty freaky, right? They are, they are one of those phenomenon that just, boom, jumps upon us, happens, no warning, or maybe we get a few seconds of warning now with, with some of the apps, but, but basically no warning. And it's just can be very scary, right? Particularly if it's a strong or an elongated um, or long duration um, uh, earthquake. So, uh, so okay. Well, I'm glad everybody here. Well, not glad. I'm. I'm. I. Uh, I'm uh, we all have context then <laughs> to talk about earthquakes. So um, we'll start with some examples of of earthquakes. Well, actually, let me let me finish. Anybody have a particular a particular earthquake memory or experience they wanted to share that was particularly noteworthy i've just only experienced like really small ones so okay. nothing like big nothing super crazy okay cool 
I take my, it. Uh, my mom was pregnant with me during the 94 earthquake and uh, oh, she earthquake. actually fell down um, the stairs and so then she had to go to the hospital with you know with me um, and what happened is it her falling caused my umbilical cord to wrap around my neck and tying a knot and all these crazy issues so she had to have me early and all this crazy stuff Wow, well, I'm an earthquake baby. I'm, gra I'm glad yeah. you're so healthy and doing well now. That's, that, that's, that, that's a good, it's a good story when it's after the fact. Right. Sort of look yeah. back, but that can be super scary. I could only imagine in the yeah. middle of a disaster having to run to the, you know, emergency services. So, well, we're yeah, super stoked you're, you're good. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. I'm gonna, I remember now Sabrina's the earthquake, uh, the earthquake kit. That's good. Yep. Okay, cool. So, um, so yeah, so let's talk about some examples of, of earthquakes um, and, uh, and some of the sort of framing examples. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, we've mentioned the uh, volcanic explosion that took out Pompeii and Herculaneum um, uh, uh, earlier, but it's, um, there was also an earthquake associated with that. So oftentimes, not, not oftentimes, but, but um, uh, frequent, frequently, when I say sometimes, <laughs> sometimes uh, earthquakes and volcanic activities uh, can be linked, right? So um, it is possible for an earthquake to trigger a, a volcanic eruption. And similarly, it's possible for a volcanic eruption to trigger a larger earthquake. Um, obviously, when the eruption actually happens, there's usually some amount of ground shaking. Um, and so there, there's some uh, correlation here. As we mentioned before, when we talked about this, this is really the first known example in the Western world. Um, obviously, earthquakes were, and volcanoes were happening you know, throughout the history of our geologically very active planet. Uh, but... Um, uh, this was really sort of the, the the first one in the Western world in terms of Western memory that we um, uh, have, and so again, it just it just ta it just puts in our head the link between a potential link between earthquakes and volcanoes. Okay, uh, this is most likely the the at least in in since humans have been around uh, the most deadly earthquake uh, that we know of. Um, in terms of how many people it killed. So this was in uh, Shenzhi, China, 1556. Again, back in the day, e even, even modern times, we saw with things like Kat Hurricane Katrina and some of these other disasters we've talked about, it can be very difficult to estimate the uh, true impact, the number of folks that have died or, or what have you, uh, cost. Um, but uh, it gets even harder when we talk about, you know, back in the day. But, but suffice it to say, the, the best guesses are on the order of, you know, a bit less than a million people killed from this one event. Um, so huge impact. Um, it uh, also uh, leads to the first recommendations for dealing with earthquakes. So a lot of, not, not all, but, but a, a good chunk of the people, for example, that died were in caves, were in hillside um, caves. And so there's suggestions about um, you know, where to live and, and how to behave. Very rudimentary, but nevertheless, this is, this is our oldest known example of um, uh, earthquake recommendation, earthquake safety recommendations. Okay, uh, we can move on to um, Lisbon. And this is 17, oh, this is 1755. I wrote 1775. This should be actually 1755. Okay. Um, so this uh, uh, killed um, uh, a good number of people in Lisbon itself. Uh, about one sixth of the people died. <clears throat> Quite large earthquake. Um, important for us, though, just to mention that this was the um, uh, first time that we, uh, that the, that the um, government said, hey, let's go do a, a, a post-impact analysis. Let's go look and see what happened. So, um, uh, you know, what was damaged exactly um, and go to all areas of Portugal to survey um, 
the impacts. So this is now the norm, right? Once we have a disaster, we come on in and we and we 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 do um, post impact analysis uh, initially for the disaster response, but then eventually for uh, under for things like insurance and also for planning and for uh, engineering failure analyses. Hey, which bridges fell? Which bridges didn't fall? Um, that type of thing. And th so this this begins in the mid 1700s. Okay, for us, uh, super important, Fort Tejon, everybody knows where Fort Tejon is? Do you guys know where Fort Tejon is? I don't. It's basically the top of the grapevine, so the five. So if we're in LA, heading towards Bakersfield, we're going over the five, we go up, 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 and then drop down just about, not exactly the summit, but near the summit is Fort Tejon. Um, uh, this is the site of uh, various uh, current conservation issues uh, related to things like condors, things like development um, of uh, what may amount to a, a new city. This is also the site of the largest, or, or the yeah, I believe it's the largest um, uh, private bequeathing of land for a protected area for, for preservation um, in California history. Um, so it's, it's, it's a huge area, uh, some of which is being developed. Anyway, at the time, uh, 1875, it was, there was this army fort there, this, this outpost. Um, and it was a, because it was a, a common uh, place where people would traverse from the Central Valley down to the Los Angeles basin. Um, now, uh, almost nobody died here. Uh, so only two folks died um, that we know of, missionaries, um, I believe. Uh, but it was a huge earthquake. And the reason why the reason it matters is this is really the model for what we think the so-called big one that everybody refers to, the, the, the big earthquake that is, is definitely coming to us here in Southern California. Um, this is the last time we saw a major movement of this fault over a very large area. So the tear, the rent in the surface of the earth was... Uh, more than 350 kilometers long. So this is a big, big um, shaking. As we've, as we've talked about, one of the things we've seen is, is natural disasters are becoming more deadly, right, and more costly um, and all that. And partly for things like wildfires, things like hurricanes, um, that's partly because of our, um, our choices in terms of our stewardship of the earth, right, in terms of things like climate change and the like. Um, uh, uh, fragmentation of landscapes, et cetera. But uh, as we also talked about, uh, one of the most important factors though, is the fact that we just have much more stuff on the landscape. We have much more costly infrastructure um, everywhere. And so when that earthquake happens, there's more dishes to break. And so therefore it's more costly. And this is absolutely illustrated by the Fort Tejon quake. Um, huge earthquake, massive earthquake, minimal human damage um, because there was minimal human um, uh, uh, things. There, there, were, there were minimum human things uh, across the landscape. Um, and this, uh, if I didn't say it, maybe I, I can't remember if I said it or not, but, but this was a, a rip, uh, a movement of the San Andreas Fault. We didn't know about the San Andreas back then, um, but we, in, in modern research, we now recognize this as one of the um, uh, most recent and most powerful movements of the two plates across um, the San Andreas Fault. Um, cool. So uh, while not super exciting in terms of human impacts or other things, definitely geologically, this is the model for um, uh, future disasters in our area. Okay, another quick one, uh, not gonna talk too much about this, but I just put this in to say that um, while we oftentimes talk about Japan, Alaska, California, these very active areas and that I'm on that you know, ring of fire for the volcanoes and the tectonic boundaries, plate, plate boundaries, absolutely where most of the action is in terms of, of earthquakes. 
but it's important to say that it's not only in those areas. So theoretically, we can get, not theoretically, in, in reality, we can get earthquakes anywhere on the surface of the earth. And so here's a, one example of that, a coastal example from um, uh, Carolina, the, the, the Carolinas. 1886 strikes the, the port town of Charleston and uh, nukes a bunch of buildings. Um, this is uh, one of the early examples uh, where, where people start to get a hint of what we now recognize as so-called liquefaction. Liquefaction is, or actually let me ask you, do, you, do you guys know what, have you guys heard of liquefaction? You guys know what that is? Okay. Um, it is the, uh, uh, when we have less consolidated strata, less, less cons consolidated sediments, et cetera, if we're on a big rock, how can I, how can I show this? If we're, on a, uh, if we're on a cup, if we're on a solid rock and we shake, as that shaking happens, as much as I bang the bottom of this rock, that's how much, you know, basically, that's how much the top of the rock is going to shake, right? So if I bang it, you know, with, with X level of force, it's going to, the top, things on top of the rock are going to move with X level of force. When we have unconsolidated soils, and depending on the, the, the frequency of the shaking, the periodicity of the waves, et cetera, um, when we have something like um, that, that, that's, that's closer to water, um, so that could be things, the classic would be mud, silt, sand, you know, non-consolidated uh, materials. Uh, when, we, when we shake the bottom here, um, you can get much greater shaking up top if it happens to be at the periodicity that, that, that um, meets the sediment. And so as a consequence, in these areas that have uh, experienced liquefaction, the ground can shake so, one, can, it can just shake a lot, but then two, it can actually start to behave like quicksand. So holes can open up, um, it can get very, um, uh, 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 non-supportive of large structures, et cetera. And so this is where when we see these um, oftentimes in coastal areas, sandy, beachy areas, that type of stuff, when we see uh, big holes open up in the ground or cars falling into to holes and things of that nature, oftentimes that's associated with liquefaction. So in the case of Charleston, the buildings that were most damaged were the ones that were over these, these unconsolidated soils and things. So that's Charleston. <clears throat> okay, now the, the famous example, um, San Francisco earthquake of 1906. Technically the, I call it San Francisco earthquake 1906 because that's what everybody commonly calls it. <clears throat> the uh, more official or uh, proper name from the USGS is the Northern California quake of 1906. That's because it was so large. It happened over such a large area. For that matter, we could refer to the Fort Tejone earthquake also as the Southern California earthquake. But, but suffice to say, everybody knows it is the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. And so that's what we'll refer to it. Um, uh, a big earthquake. Um, really, uh, huge ramifications. So uh, just like we talked about the Galveston hurricane um, struck at the cultural center, the political center, the economic center of Texas in 1900, the same thing happened here um, with, uh, with San Francisco. Now, San Francisco obviously is still a big city and still an important area economically and culturally, but Back in the early 1900s, it was the city. Op as we talked about before, how do you know if it's back in the day, if it's a, if it's a popular American city, has an opera, has lots of orphanages, has all of this, um, not just core infrastructure, but all these ancillary cultural elements, theaters, um, entertainment venues, um, all that kind of stuff. And so, so San Francisco was it, San Francisco was the place. Um, uh, and, and it was the place where uh, everybody thought the power center would remain. Um, huge ramifications for the state of California uh, in the wake of this. Obviously, the big story 
well, not obviously. Um, so there's the shaking, the, the earthquake itself, uh, or the, the onset of the first quake, and then the aftershocks kept coming. Um, the, uh, the, the majority of the damage did not come from the earthquake or earthquakes proper, rather came from the damage to the infrastructure and then the resulting fire that was not able to be controlled because of the damage to that infrastructure. So gas lines ruptured and, cooked and started fires. Water lines ruptured and there was no way to get water to places. Um, San Francisco, uh, for folks that maybe haven't been there, is a hilly place. At least much of San Francisco is a hilly place. So getting water up a big hill is virtually impossible if you don't have pressured lines, particularly in the context of a disaster. Um, this area, uh, this was on the San Andreas Fault. This ruptured an area larger than the Fort Tejon earthquake. So this um, ripped almost 450 kilometers or, or, or saw land movement along almost 450 kilometers of California. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, so huge issues. So again, San Andreas Fault, which uh, we actually named in the wake of the 1906 earthquake. This was, this was the, the, the name comes from a, an area that was, was named before the 1906 earthquake, but in the wake, in the ac academic studies that come in the wake of the 1906 earthquake, it's, it's um, the name San Andreas becomes the name for the entire fault. And so that's what we have uh, kept. Um, and uh, while we haven't talked about this yet, we're just sort of running through examples. We are looking at the, the, the shoving, the moving of these two uh, plates. Now, an earthquake is um, friction, basically. So an earthquake is the building up of pressure, friction, restricting movement and then at some point that 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 friction giving way and and movement occurring and that's what we perceive to be uh, an earthquake and that, that's what is an earthquake and the shaking is going to shake go until in this case we're talking about a uh, one plate slipping past another plate um, the shaking is going to happen until enough pressure is released and that friction builds up again and and the, and the shaking stops. Um, the San and so the North American plate is moving basically uh, up and to the left in this picture, and the Pacific plate is moving down and to the right. Um, it's moving the San and, and, and these two plates are moving past each other at, at essentially the same speed as your fingernails grow. So uh, that might not seem like a lot of movement, but um, that's moving over the whole of the area. And um, that leads to a lot of pressure when we have, you know, tens of thousands of square miles of, of, uh, of, of material that is moving. Um, and uh, obviously with earthquakes, things move and fit and start, fits and starts. If this fault was perfectly lubricated, and the pressure built up, and these plates just moved along at you know, um, you know, part of, par parts of you know, fractions of centimeters a year. Uh, we wouldn't have the earthquake. The earthquake is the result of the, um, or is a consequence of friction, and the building up of pressures. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, so, so in the wake of the 1906 earthquake, we we recognized the San Andreas fault, and then uh, through subsequent work, we realized there's all kinds of faults all over the place, right? So in the in the vicinity of the San Francisco Bay Area, these are just the major ones. There are many, many other side shoots and 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 smaller uh, scale uh, cracks, basically. Um, but uh, but this is the th these are the main ones that we that we are uh, worried about and think about the Hayward Fault, uh, the San Andreas, the San Gregorio. Okay, another key thing here, as as we alluded to, is this making sense, you guys? Question so far. Um, I had one question. Yeah, so just for the smaller faults, um, are those since obviously the San Andreas Fault is like where the 
big giant plates are connecting but are those are, are there like like how do those ones work there's not like sure. a bunch of little plates right sure yeah yeah so well they're not little plates but rather it's um it's so imagine it's uh uh we had a, a wooden two by four right and we're leaning on the two by four so the pressure is maybe on the end of the board on the end of the here let me show you so on the end of the board right and so we might say that the, pr the the pressure point is where my finger or the force is being exerted where my finger yeah is pushing down on the, on the on the pen so that that's that's the point of contact so that might be we might call that the 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 san andreas if you will yeah and so it's pushing down it, yes it is possible my my finger will slip off and then it'll, it'll cause the pen to pop up or the the you know that kind of thing but realize also along the whole length of this pen as i'm as i'm pushing here there's pressure there's compression and and you know there's some resistance in the in the plastic of the pen and that kind of stuff but there's forces all up and down so even though the main the main pressure is here by my finger there can be cracks and and uh, uh, other other um, presentations across the length of that. Again, it's not as if uh, the the rock from the, let's say the San Andreas fault to the right in our image is all homogeneous, right? There's different things. There's some granites here. There's there's all kinds of different structures. So how those how those different how that force uh, plays out in this complex geology will lead to different cracks so it's not so much that there's a plate at the rogers there is not a plate there, there, excuse me there are not two plates meeting at the rogers creek fault for example but rather th there's there's a tear in there um and so that and so that those tears are i don't i'm not a geophysicist i don't i don't understand the specifics but it has to do with um not just the the dissimilarity of the material of the of the substratum, um, but also how the San Andreas is moving. And so, uh, the, so the San Andreas uh, might have a more intense uh, crack in one spot and then, and then a little bit less um, intense meeting in another spot. And so, so yeah, so, so think of it as the, um, think of it as the sort of knock on effects of the main fault. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Any other uh, questions for stuff I've said so far? about stuff I've said so far. Okay, we'll keep going. So faults. Um, now, another key aspect of, uh, of, of, of what happens in the wake of our uh, earthquakes um, lie in our choices, lie in the, in the memory of the actions that we've taken. So, Obviously, um, the biggest story in California uh, after the genocide of the native peoples and the colonization of the, the area by uh, first the Spanish um, and then the Mexican government, and then Mexican government takes over, and then we take over. We take over, the Americans take over um, primarily because of gold. And so uh, this is this is a you know, hey. You know, so this, this is a classic story. So, hey, you can go to this quote unquote unpopulated. Obviously, there was many native peoples. It was um, some of our data suggests that particularly the area around central California, San Francisco to central California um, might have been uh, the most densely populated um, uh, part of North America uh, pre-European settlement. So there, there was a lot of um, uh, of culture here, there's a lot of history, there's a lot of active management of the landscape, all that kind of stuff um, before European settlers arrived. Um, uh, but nevertheless, the time it was perceived as being basically empty, right, from the, the, the colonists' perspective, right, the colonizers' perspective. And so, oh my gosh, we find gold uh, near Sutter's Mill, and everybody come on over. And so this is this is exactly what people saw all around the US, all around the world. So get on these clipper ships, right? This was before the railroad. This was before fast uh, terrestrial transportation. So the fastest way to get, the, get to San Francisco from New Orleans or New York or, or 
whatever was to jump on a, a, a schooner clipper ship scoot around the tip of south america come on up and and uh, land in port as a consequence uh and also uh, san francisco was the best naturally protected port uh and harbor um on the west coast so there's the you know san francisco bay was is an amazing thing geologically uh turns out san francisco bay looks the way it looks because of earthquakes and because of the movements of the plate but in any event um okay so here uh we have the start of the gold rush right so we have um this expansion of how of buildings etc and we're starting to see um uh this all, all these ships in the harbor yeah and and these ships are basically where downtown Market Street is right now. If you get if you know San Francisco, so this is the picture just a a, a year or so later. Um, uh, I mean, so I don't know how many. We have, let's count. Let's see if we can count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. I don't know, on the order of about 50-ish uh, uh, tall masted sailing vessels in this, in this cove, right? This your buena cove. Here's later, I can't even begin to count this. I don't know if you guys can, had to guess, but I don't know, just in this one little area, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 16. I mean, I mean, you can't even, you can't even distinguish boats here, right? So all kinds of vessels, what was going, does anybody know what, what was going on here? Why there's so many vessels here? So what was happening was this, everybody was wanting to get rich quick. So these crews, so this is this is the most pro this become in a sh very short order of time, this becomes the most profitable shipping route in terms of bringing people anywhere in the world. So people are paying top dollar to get on these boats, come to San, San Francisco. They get to San Francisco, they anchor up, they get on their dinghies and they roar to they, they row to shore, get out here, buy some picks, buy some shovels, buy some Levi's from people like uh, Leland Stanford um, and, uh, and, and, and go up to this way, up to the left over here. So they go up the, towards the Sierra Nevadas up the San Francisco Bay. Actually, they would jump on a, on a, a steamer, a, a paddle wheel boat, and they would, and they would get, um, they would travel up the rivers and then get to the foothills and then, and then walk from the foothills into the, um, gold country, Sierra Nevadas, et cetera, and start panning for gold and trying to get rich quick. Gold fever had gripped the world, really, but especially our country. And so what was happening is these ships would pull up, anchor up, and everybody would leave. I mean, everybody would leave. So the, the uh, passengers would leave, the crew would leave. The captain would leave. The entire vessel would be abandoned. So what we're looking at here aren't aren't hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of of, of vessels that have just dumped off people and are heading back to New Hampshire or whatever to get a load. These are vessels that have been abandoned, and these are these are major structures, right, in this uh, tidal estuary. So huge problem. Uh, this is a uh, map of the area of San Francisco Bay uh, and the area around San Francisco um, by the U.S. Coastal Survey uh, in uh, just after the start of the gold rush, right? So here we are. So this is the Golden Gate. This is where the Golden Gate Bridge will uh, eventually span um, many decades later. Wait, sorry, how come they would abandon the ships? Because they wanted to get rich. Even the crew? Hmm. Oh, and they wouldn't come back for them? No, it's totally crazy. Yeah. It, it doesn't sound, <laughs> I mean, we're used to our, uh, you know, Instagram success and our kind of, you know, social media crazy. This was crazy, you know, circa 1850. Uh, I mean, just crazy, crazy. So, so when we look at the map, we see there's things like this Yerba, Yerba Buena Cove and stuff. 
those don't exist anymore. Um, and in fact, and so what the um, uh, what folks did was to to actually just because there's all these vessels out there, right? People need brothels, people need bars, people need all these things. So they actually start, and again, mud in the tidal estuary. So they anchored up the boat, but at low tide, sometimes these boats would, would almost be, you know, leaning on their sides. So folks just started uh, uh, putting out planks, you know, bo boardwalks out to these boats and just cutting holes in the side and turning these, turning these vessels into structures. Right into a bar, into a restaurant, into a whatever, um, and then, and then, as all these as all these vessels are in the, the shallow tidal estuary, we start hydraulic. Uh, so, so initially, the first little bit, the first you know year or two, people are out there with the, the classic, the classic these guys, right? Picks, shovels panning for gold if any of you guys in the whatever it is fifth or sixth grade whenever whenever it is if you guys did the the california module in your in your your uh classes you might have gone up to sutter's mill and you can do that now or, or if you go up there for vacation you can actually pan for gold that's the that's the sort of romantic so-called so vision of how people mind that's not what actually well i mean that happened a little bit but very quickly people switch to hydraulic mining meaning they started capturing the force of of rivers channeling that water into ever smaller uh, sluices and pipes and then directed that water just like we would a high pressure hose like we're fighting a fire but directing that water at the soils of the sierra foothills and the sierra nevada mountains to massively 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 erode the soils so that they could they could turn all that soil into something they could put through a sluice box and sift for gold that way. As a consequence, all these sediments poured down the, our, our main waterways, dumped into San Francisco Bay, and essentially the area all around these vessels silted in and, and, and filled in. So we filled in something like one third of the San Francisco Bay, not by evil capitalist developers or any of those things we sometimes think about or shopping mall magnets or whatever, but rather it was the active erosion of the Sierra Nevadas to look for gold and the mad rush for profits that, that led to all the sediment coming in. So these vessels then essentially got there, they were, they were getting stuck in the mud. And then as we dump more and more mud, they consolidated around them. Right. And so these vessels were either, uh, we either, cut off the wood to use elsewhere in San Francisco, or they just became structures themselves, and then they became completely buried. And so this is a this is a excavation of this vessel called the General Harrison. And this is in downtown San Francisco, so the financial district. So if you just walk there today, and if you don't have any knowledge, you'll think you're walking on regular, regular land, right? Regular rocky land, but it's not. And so virtually every single time we, we put a skyscraper in, this high real estate area, um, you have to put strong foundations, right? We don't just lay it on the surface. We, we dig down these, you know, pilings partly to deal with earthquakes, um, actually primarily to deal with earthquakes and, and, and shaking and the like. And almost invariably when we do that, we find these kinds of vessels. The whole area is lousy with, with archeology span and, and, and cool old, old ships and, and, and the like. And so that's what we're looking at here in, in the, in the pit of, um, uh, where a, a new skyscraper is going in, we find this. So they discover it, halt uh, construction of the skyscraper for a little while, while the archaeologists come in, document what's going on, look if there's something to, to be salvaged, uh, uh, you know, uh, what have you. And so that area is, is the mission, right? So, so we call this uh, Mission Bay now. This is where UC San Francisco is putting a big new biotech um, hub. Anyway, uh, so so these areas highlighted in red. Okay, so this was this was this was that area where um, you know sort of downtown. Here's Market Street. This is the this is the big financial district of San Francisco um, to this day. 
Um, and so this is where everybody uh, located, and this is where all those vessels were abandoned and were, you know, this, and were eventually sedimented in around. But now we've put all these buildings. Now we've put all this, these, you know, entertainment venues and 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 changing houses and all that kind of stuff. So this map shows where liquefaction is the greatest. So again, these are on the non-consolidated soils. These are on the soils that are more slippery. And so when we have um, uh, earthquake, when we have that shaking, the periodicity of the shaking can be massively magnified. So, um, so part of the risk um, that we that that played out in 1906 was the fact that we uh, chose to develop and we chose to um, um, uh, change the landscape in the manner that we did. So, liquefaction a huge story. Um, the other thing that the earthquake uh, does is uh, has some interesting, uh, all kinds of interesting social consequences. Um, at the time, one of the major labor forces um, in this part of the world were, uh, we, we now think about folks from Latin America, from Mexico, from Guatemala, whatever is doing sort of the menial tasks, et cetera. Back in the uh, 1800s, it was uh, many different groups, but particularly folks from China. And so uh, there's all kinds of racism that, that comes out of this. This is a cartoon from 1882. And uh, it, it, um, one of the things that was happening, there's many things we could talk about, but uh, for example, an additional tax that was applied to foreign, foreigners that wanted to do mining um, in, in the Sierra Nevadas. Um, it leads to the 1882 uh, chi so-called Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, all kinds of, you know, we know it today as build the wall um, and, and all the rhetoric associated with that. Um, long story short, it was often portrayed as the U.S. versus the foreigner, right? Although in reality, um, while there were all kinds of folks that were um, considered lower class and, and not of our station, uh, Irish and, and you name it. Um, but in particular, uh, in this part of the world, uh, the Chinese were considered the lowest of the low, right? They were, they were, really, they were really bad. Maybe they were kind of on par with Native Americans, but you know, all the racism and everything that was there. One of the consequences in the wake of the 1906 earthquake because, and fire, um, was was now people want to move, right? So if we look at this, these areas are the most destroyed, yeah? These areas are the, um, the most problematic, where there was the most destruction. And so everybody flees. One of the places they flee to is the western part of San Francisco. So go, the Golden Gate Park, uh, or Golden Gate Park here, um, originally was a bit longer. Um, parts of it are cut out because we, this actually becomes a place where, where people move to. And so people move to the natural area and essentially just pitch tents because they're freaked out that their houses are going to fall, or, or even if their houses were, were uh, survived the earthquake and fire, people are freaked out that another shaking is going to knock them down. Um, and so, so there's pressure to move out. There's pressure to, to move from this, at least temporarily, from this big uh, you know, business area into the wet, more western parts of the city, and one of those parts is 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 Chinatown, which is this to this day is, is a very distinct, uh, very important part of the city of San Francisco. But there's this initial pressure to to get rid of the Chinese and let, let, let's move into their area because their area wasn't quite as badly damaged as some of the area other areas of the city. Um, Happily, uh, the Chinese community was able to resist that. But one of the other uh, interesting benefits of the earthquake is because of these, these Chinese exclusion acts and all these racist policies, um, you couldn't easily uh, uh, um, get citizenship. If you were a businessman, if you're a wealthy person, it was possible, but if you were a poor laborer or something like that, not really possible. Also, if you were born outside the U.S., you couldn't become naturalized a naturalized citizen, right? Europeans could. Europeans could become a naturalized American citizen, 
The Chinese couldn't. So if you were born elsewhere, you were if you're a, a, a someone from China and you were born in China, you were never going to be allowed to become an American citizen. But as we talked about with with Katrina and things of that nature, the disaster comes. Um, one of the casualties are records, right? Are the are the the written memory of who was what, birth certificates, wedding certificates, death certificates, all that kind of stuff. And so as a consequence, all these uh, uh, Chinese folks after the after the earthquake went back and or went to City Hall after things sort of settled down and said, "Hey, look, I need my need my um, the equivalent of our modern driver's license, right? Hey, need need my papers, need my this, need my that. I got to get got to get back on the voting rolls and all that kind of stuff." And uh, they were able to establish citizenship because there was no record of them not being born here, right? So they just said, "Yeah, of course I was born here. What year were you born? I don't know. You know, 1890 or whatever the." whatever the thing was. So this actually allowed the, the um, franchisement, normally we talk about the disenfranchisement of groups in the wake of disasters, and that absolutely happened here. But, but for our Chinese colleagues and friends, they were actually able to, to sort of uh, run around the system because the, the infrastructure was so destroyed and the records specifically were so destroyed. So, so we got, for the first time, we got around this by invitation only. If you're a Chinese person, you could actually um, uh, uh, become a citizen and uh, still still didn't obviously erase racism or anything like that, but, but it was a, a very interesting side effect. Then there's all kinds of cultural and other cultural impacts. Um, and I think the mo one that's the most conspicuous is the um, uh, a transition of uh, cultural capital. So back in say 1905, San Francisco was it. San Francisco was absolutely the, the political powerhouse, cultural powerhouse, et cetera. Uh, in the late 1800s, Edison had invented uh, uh, the motion picture uh, camera and had started what became a little, you know, the, the first film uh, industry in New Jersey or around, around uh, his, uh, his um, labs and stuff. Then people started figuring out they could do this themselves. And so these sort of uh, independent uh, movie and, and entertainment, well, we'll say movie movie industry started growing up around New Jersey and they started getting heat from Edison. So then they moved to Cuba and they quickly moved out to California. Because San Francisco was where all the famous actors were, where all the fam famous opera people were, vaudeville was, all that kind of stuff, right? All that all that entertainment, the natural place for the entertainment industry to go would have been to San Francisco. But now San Francisco is destroyed. So then instead of heading to San Francisco, they start heading to Southern California. And in very rapid succession, we have a bunch of independent studios that are making a gazillion million, you know, cheap movies, uh, you know, by the day. And then that leads to the powerhouse of Hollywood actually being born. And the modern entertainment industry really being birthed in Southern California as opposed to Northern California. Um, so as we've seen with, with uh, again, with Galveston and some of these other issues, there's real con there are real consequences um, to these disasters. And when these disasters are of the scale that they're going to um, you know, curtail uh, all this economic activity, um, the forces that were not directly impacted energy, entertainment, um, banking, whatever, they're going to, there's a high likelihood they're going to shift. And okay. Uh, whoops. So I guess, okay. Uh, so yeah. So anyway, so, 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 so we saw, we, we saw that in the wake of, um, of the 1906 earthquake too. Um, the other thing that, that uh, 1906 starts us down the road, it starts us down the road to understanding the modern theory of plate tectonics of the moving of um, these uh, these onion skins around the surface of the earth, these onion skins of crust. And so that's what that's we're just illustrating here, the movement of these different um, continental plates and continental, the theory of continental drift. Um, and so, so we begin to get some hints at that with the uh, 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Um, also the 1906 earthquake really sets us down a path of our modern 
um, the modern field of seismology, the modern field of the study of earthquakes. And that gets going by the so-called Lawson Report. Lawson is a, is a, Andrew Lawson is a um, professor uh, at, um, uh, came from Canada and uh, was a professor at UC, what we now call UC Berkeley. And um, uh, in the immediate wake, just like we saw with um, Portugal, uh, the government said, hey, we got to understand what the hell happened here. And so uh, charges Lawson, along with several other uh, famous scientists, to go figure out what was going on. And so they, they started going around up and down uh, the coast, up and down San Francisco, north of San Francisco, south of San Francisco, and, and mapping out initially what happened. And uh, from this effort, we get one of the most famous images, which is in many, many, um, uh, you know, geoscience textbooks and stuff. This is this um, uh, fence. So this fence, this wooden fence here, before, you know, before the earthquake, before October of 1906, uh, was, um, um, wait, was it October? That, that was the Loma Prieta that was in October. Anyway, um, before the 1906 earthquake was one contiguous fence on this farm uh, up near um, Santa Rosa in the Northern Bay area. After the earthquake, the fence jumped all that distance because the fence was essentially literally on the San Andreas Fault. So now if you go up to the same site, you'll see that there's actually, the fence is still there like this. There's actually a little metal gate that, that uh, you know, continues the fence here so that they can contain their cattle or whatever it is they're doing. Um, so the Lawson crew goes up and down the state of California and they map these, the, what we now understand as the um, as the San Andreas. And so what they begin to realize is what we're seeing in both in the area of the active fault and then the area of these other faults that they start to discover. What we've essentially seen here in this case, we've seen the renting of the earth. We see the ripping of the earth. And then what's happened here is so this is you know old old material, old material. The earthquake has 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 move these these um, soils apart and then erosion has filled in in this little dip area so this material so this material and this material are, are the same or, or very similar right and this is different this this is more erosive uh, uh, sedimentary um, accumulation inside that thing so they went up and down the coast and they mapped this what we now call the san andreas fault um, and here's a little uh, uh, video we'll watch on YouTube, it's just like about a minute, of the, the current best guess as to the, um, the propagation of the 1906 earthquake. Let me restart this. Okay, so it starts about, about uh, just offshore, just off of Daly City area, and it propagates. Along the fault, and so we see, we see movement um, or, 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 the, or the greatest intensity of shaking along the fault, right? But we also see these additional um, um, waves, right? So, sort of concentrations of shaking. Santa Rosa actually experiences the greatest shaking um, in, in terms of a, a concentrated area um, uh, because of the soils it's on and because of the harmonics of the, of the sediments. So they actually um, bear a huge impact. And as I mentioned, the, the fence picture is, is from um, the northern part of the bay. It wasn't in San Francisco proper. So have a look, now we're at almost a minute. The shaking is still going on, right? Everybody's experiencing the shaking. Shaking is most intense or, or hottest or most red in this visualization along the San Andreas. Okay, let's watch it one more time. Um, so boom, starts offshore and now we're shaking, shaking. So if you're in San Francisco, you're shaking, 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 right? Continuing to shake, continuing to shake. You're thinking at this point, what the heck's going on? 
Is this like the wrath of God? Uh, 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 you know, I, are these demons coming up out of the ground? What's going on? Shake, 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 shake. Um, things are falling off the, the walls. Maybe the walls themselves are falling, right? And you're thinking, what, you know, my God, what, what's going on? And it's not stopping, right? It's continuing to shake. It's continuing to shake. It's continuing to shake. And you're thinking, how do I get out of here? Maybe you can't even stand up anymore. Maybe you've fallen down because the shaking is such you can't keep your footing. Um, and, you know, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? At this point, um, the lines have broken, the, the um, uh, gas lines have broken, and uh, fires are beginning to start. Uh, most of the reports of the fires sort of reference them about 20 to 40 minutes after the, um, after the first shaking, but clearly they started before then. It's just they begin to pick up speed and become a larger signal um, about uh, 40 minutes after the fire. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, and then we'll, we'll take a, a pause here, take a break in a second. Oh, wow, sorry. Wow, that was old timey, old timey earthquake music. Wow, that's interesting. Okay, so just to finish this up then, um, by way of introducing uh, uh, the 1906 earthquake, uh, the last thing I'll say is another key element that we see that comes out of 1906 very clearly is this whole idea of spin and PR. So we'd had the Galveston hurricane of 1900, and it had become quite clear that, that by this point, 1906, the power center of Texas had moved to Houston, right? Had left the energy industry, the banking industry, et cetera, cultural capital had left Galveston and moved to another place. So city fathers were freaked out that this would happen to their precious um, city by the bay. So they um, report ridiculously low numbers. So they report on the order of about 300 people dead from the earthquake and fire. Uh, the, uh, the Presidio, which is an army barracks, which is, which is just uh, now it's just underneath and just, just, just below the, um, the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, but that was a big, big, you know, um, defensive position to defend the port of San Francisco and the harbor of San Francisco. Uh, uh, so the army general is in charge, basically takes over emergency operations and responding to, to dealing with fires and things of that nature. And so he, he goes in and he does his estimate and he says uh, that there's you know only about 500 people that die in California, or excuse me, that die in the city of San Francisco proper 64 in Santa Rosa, which is a much smaller town, uh, and uh, a, a, about over 100 in San Jose at the bottom of San Francisco uh, Bay. Uh, a NOAA reevaluation of this uh, decades later estimates that it was probably at least many, many hundreds. And then more extensive research puts the number closer at um, around 3,000 people. We still don't know. But, but on the order about 3,000 folks. But, but in other words, the estimates of death are an order of magnitude too low. And it's very clear that wasn't because of an accident. This wasn't the first telegraph that came out and, or the first cub reporter made an, made an estimate. This is, this is San Francisco and the powers that be actively trying to under, to downplay the consequences of the, the disaster. So this is a spin effort. This is a public relations effort uh, uh, positioned, aimed at um, uh, making people think they can still come to San Francisco, making businesses still think this is a place to invest in San Francisco, making the uh, cultural organizations not flee, right? Um, at the time, though, uh, San Francisco is a, a bit less than half a million people on that order of magnitude. And, uh, you know, about half of those folks instantly become homeless, right? And so, so there's huge issues with just base, providing basic um, uh, protections from the elements and, and getting enough water and food, et cetera. Massive numbers of buildings are destroyed. Huge uh, financial burden. 
um, not just in San Francisco, but in Oakland and in all the surrounding communities as well. So it's, it's a huge deal. And, um, and there's strong efforts. And we see this time and time again. We see this with a Florida right now during COVID, right? So Florida's saying, yep, we're great. Uh-huh. Yep. Nope. All is good. No problem here. Everybody should come vacation here in Florida, right? Even though Florida has a higher incident rates, incident rate of infection and, and more problematic um, uh, hospitalization rates, et cetera, uh, less, less even distri distribution of vaccine than places like California, but yet they, they're on a hardcore spin to convince people, particularly on the Eastern seaboard, that they should come vacation there. They should come spend spring break there. They should come spend summer there. It's all good. It's all fun. It's all safe. No worries. Um, and that is, that's partly the political scene that's going on, but it's also the, the daughter of 1906, right? It's also the daughter of folks really trying hard to convince everybody else that there isn't a problem, right? The problem right before their eyes, nothing to see here, nothing to see here. Um, just, just come on, it, it'll be fine, it'll be good. Um, and so cool. Okay, with that, uh, we'll next talk about uh, Japan, but I think we'll take a quick 10 minute break here and we'll, we'll um, pick up in 10 minutes. Zoom recording. Okay, cool. Um, let us keep going. Okay. Um, uh, keeping on that, that idea that <clears throat> even though we, we, we so often focus on uh, outright measurable um, infrastructure destruction, human life destruction and financial cost destruction as the most typical metrics we look at disasters or, or we, we view disasters through those lenses. Um, another example, uh, which is uh, again, Japan like California, very susceptible to earthquakes being in a very active um, tectonic area. Um, but we also see uh, all kinds of consequences. So in this case, large earthquake, Lots of people died. Over 100,000 people died uh, in Japan in 1923, um, both from the uh, earthquake itself and the resulting tsunami, which we'll get to after today. Um, essentially, the shaking can shove water around, and that water can um, uh, induce a tsunami, uh, both locally and potentially across ocean basins. Um, huge impact. Again, we. this is only, you know, 100 years ago, but we still had no real um, idea what was going on with earthquakes. At least we had no uh, uh, great theories um, to really explain what was going on. And so a lot of hysteria kicks in. There's uh, traditional animosities between the Japanese, Chinese, and Korean civilizations. And um, um, it, it it led to a lot of uh, racial um, violence um, and a lot of persecution and folks in Japan, for example, blaming, somehow blaming the Chinese or the Koreans as the cause of this horrible uh, earthquake, which of course was nonsense. But uh, in the wake of sci a robust scientific understanding and when people are hurt and, and scared, they obviously, um, way too frequently default back to old prejudices, et cetera. And that's what happened in 1923. Closer to home, two years later, the Santa Barbara quake uh, uh, doesn't, again, one of these examples where it does not um, uh, kill many people, only about a dozen or so, um, uh, and, and you know, had impacts. Uh, but we, in particular, this is the first real um, um, looking at uh, building codes. Well, I mean, there were, there were building codes changed after 1906, but, but in, um, in a more robust way, particularly with regards to uh, dams and uh, dams up, uh, up river of, um, uh, civilization, of civilizations or establishments. Um, so Santa Barbara really drives that first looking at dams. Similar thing happens a decade later in Long Beach, although here most of the Again, not that many fatalities, 
but almost all the fatalities are associated with schools. So kids inside school buildings that collapsed uh, on them. And so this leads us to our current state of affairs, which is um, um, schools in California and indeed in many places of the country now are built to a higher standard to, to deal with earthquakes than, um, than our, your home, for example. And so the idea is people were so outraged by the death of children. Um, this, doesn't, this doesn't count when we talk about gun violence because we don't seem to care about that when it comes to gun violence. But with regards to these other things like natural disasters, when children are particularly vulnerable, that, that um, is, a, is a unifying factor to get uh, movement in terms of on regulations, in terms of on laws and, and that uh, policies, that, that type of stuff. So our current, um, uh, the FIELD Act uh, and, and, and the, the daughter regulations and policies um, really now make our schools built to a much higher standard. So for example, when I had my water leak, uh, slab leak the, um, you know, a few weeks ago, whatever, and I was talking to the plumbers about grades of copper pipes. We have three basic grades of copper pipes um, in most of our buildings here in California. And, and they go from thin walled copper to very thick walled copper. The plumbers don't really like dealing with the thickest of the thick wall because it's very hard to cut and it, it's logistically challenging. Um, he says, we only really put that in in hospitals and uh, schools. And that again is a consequence of the Long Beach earthquake of 1933. Uh, uh, this is the largest earthquake ever recorded to date. Uh, this is in 1960 in Chile. So have a look, right? So, so now, so largest earthquake, 9.5. We haven't talked about the Richter scale or stuff yet, but, but basically 9.5, big earthquake. Uh, on, only 6,000 uh, people uh, dead or maybe a little bit more than that. In any event, uh, we're starting to see there isn't necessarily, I mean, there, there's a general correlation, of course, between uh, shaking and deaths, but the actual numbers of deaths, the actual amount of damage uh, isn't necessarily directly related to the, the outright magnitude, right? It's depending on all these things. It's depending on the structures. It's depending on this, the soils and, and how they how they manifest that particular earthquake event, um, uh, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, okay. Then also in addition, this this earthquake is also one of those examples where we see a volcanic um, eruption in the in the immediate wake, about a day and a half after um, we see an eruption of the Cordon Cale. Uh, then uh, uh, one of the best covered earthquakes um, in California, I mean, I mean, in the US, excuse me, um, is the 1964 Alaska earthquake, um, which hits uh, um, essentially vaguely near Anchorage, right in the southern part of the state where most of the people live. Huge impacts, huge impacts. Um, uh, massive rents, or renting of the earth. So you see some of the um, shifting of the roadbed here um, in downtown Anchorage, and just crazy. The J.C. Penney Building, which was just had just been a uh, brand new building, had just been built, was you know nuked, and and there was all kinds of destruction. Um, the reason fatalities weren't as um, as bad as they could have been uh, was primarily because of the um, the fact that people that we're relatively and still to this day, Alaska is a relatively small population center. People are relatively distributed. People were in, uh, for the most part, single story houses in their homes in the morning um, when this happened, and not in some kind of you know Los Angeles or San Francisco or Houston skyscrapers or anything like that. Um, nevertheless, this is the second largest earthquake that we know of to date. Um, so the Chilean one in 1960 huge. <clears throat> now, we mentioned the, the, the idea of plate tectonics, and we, di we didn't really have a theory when the 1906 earthquake happened. Um, uh, we've really birthed this modern industry of seismology um, in a very real way in the wake of 1906. 
the Japanese also very, very advanced in terms of thinking and trying to understand earthquakes and the shaking and the, and the, and the disasters that come from them. So things are beginning to gel and things are beginning to make some sense. And we're getting all these clues. 1964 happens in Alaska. And then another earthquake in Japan, also in 1964. Now everybody's mobilized, right? And so, so these, these two earthquakes really provide um, uh, the sort of final touches. And so <clears throat> in the <clears throat> uh, two, in year or two in the wake of this, we really get the codification and the official and the official um, uh, uh, putting forward of plate tectonic theory and of a, a, a whole lot of support that's been building for decades. And we really seem to, to nail it down in the late 60s, partly because of these two earthquakes that are so close to each other and allow a comparison and contrast uh, between the two earthquakes, but then also to look at how um, uh, the movement of, of plates and particularly along boundaries could explain what was going on. Um, yeah, I guess I'll say that. Okay, cool. Uh, so getting, getting near the end of our examples here. So in San, the San Fernando Valley, we have um, uh, the, uh, this area near Silmar. And we have an earthquake, again, not that many people died, but the important thing was this almost was orders of magnitude more deadly. <clears throat> this particular dam, uh, because we were in a drought, this is, again, we talked about the, inter <laughs> the intersection of all these uh, and the interaction of all of these natural disasters. Uh, we've so far talked about the issue of um, volcanoes, earthquakes, but uh, this one is our first example of the effect of drought. So because we are experiencing a drought, this reservoir was relatively low. If it had been um, to its, its more typical uh, full um, state, it almost assuredly would have failed and uh, would, have, would have led to a massive wall of water that would have gone down to the, the population centers below. And, you know, Many, many, many tens of thousands of people were in the immediate uh, downstream area, and you know at least at least tens of thousands of people would probably be additional people be dead, and so we escaped it. Um, uh, uh, ha had and so you see the the destruction the damage to the dam here. Um, if the water been a little bit higher, it most likely would have started sloshing over. That sloshing over would have led to some toe erosion over here at the base of the dam and led to a, almost assuredly a pretty quick, uh, just like we saw with the Oroville Dam, uh, beginning of eroding of the, the, the structural support. And then that would have given way and would have been a huge flush of water. And this leads to the California uh, Dam Safety Act. So it's now really um, difficult to build a, a dam in California because uh, we have so, we're so worried about their failing during a large earthquake. Um, <clears throat> okay, Mexico City. This is in uh, 1985. Lots of people died here. Now, the interesting thing is here, the epicenter was pretty darn far away from, the, um, from, from Mexico City proper. However, because of the, so Mexico City is in a, a dried lake bed. It's in a sort of you know, low point of, of uh, the area. And it sits on erosional sediments, depositional sediments. And so um, the earthquake really had um, uh, huge effects. Because of the, the, the frequency of the shaking, um, certain buildings were in huge trouble. And so those built, so short, short stature buildings, one, two, three, four, five building tended to do fine. Uh, really large buildings, skyscrapers tended to do fine, but buildings that were of this intermediary height. So here uh, noted between six and 15 stories, those suffered, those were almost all knocked down. And they were just at the right harmonic to shake the most and shake and fall apart. 
And those tended to be the ones that were most typically apartment complexes. So that's one of the reasons why so many people died in this particular um, earthquake in 1985. Okay, uh, another local example, Loma Prieta. Some of you might know this is the Bay Area quake or the Bay quake or the World Series quake. So this started, this, um, started in October um, evening just as the World Series was starting. So obviously, and, and, and it was a, the, the Bay Series, so it was the San Francisco Giants playing the Oakland A's. And so it was you know, a huge thing, and, and, and you know, Nation is watching this live telecast of the sporting event. People are watching, and as they're watching it, um, all of a sudden stuff starts to shake. Um, and the series would go on to be, the game would obviously be, be postponed, the series delayed, um, and uh, this was this huge deal. Now, um, so only a few people died, uh, a few tens of folks died, many of them uh, on these, uh, so these are these uh, expressways, these, these um, elevated freeways that collapsed. Um, so one in near Oakland in particular had a lot of dead folks. Uh, unfortunately, they were essentially squished in their cars uh, as they're coming home to commute. However, um, there's a lot of so-called credit given to the um, um, World Series because this happened essentially at commute time, uh, uh, evening commute time. Um, if this had happened uh, during a regular commute time, there would probably most likely have been many more people on the road. Or if it had been between the Yankees and the whoever, right? It would have been there been probably many more people on the road, but because it was such a San Francisco phenomenon, everybody ran home or didn't go to work that day or work from home or whatever it was. Uh, and so people were, were mostly home in their single story, two story homes and not in these, uh, on these uh, 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 transportation structures, which were the, um, uh, one of the greatest sources of death. Um, and I'd made a little video this weekend when we were up there just to talk about this very briefly. Um, that I will uh, uh, link in our readings and viewings page. Um, this is this is uh, uh, so part of the so. Uh, I was in I was an undergrad at UCSB at the time. I was in a uh, my GE art class, which was pottery. So I was throwing clay, and I was I'm very bad at I can't do. But I was desperately trying to make the world's best cereal bowl. Uh, so I kept trying to make these this bigger and bigger bowls. I was trying. And so at, at the studio at UCSB, they would put on a, a radio station. And there was all these students doing their clay stuff, right? As I imagine, we do the same at, at, our, at our art department when people are just working on stuff for, you know, an hour on end or two hours on end. And so I was working on it. And they had this, they had a K-Tide on there, this sort of classic rock station. And, and so I'm sitting there throwing my, throwing my pot doing screwing up making it wobble and everything and then on comes or there's a, some song i don't know rolling stones or led zeppelin or something um and they play a song and then the dj comes on and he says oh hey just so you know uh there's a little earthquake up in the san francisco bay area today um so yeah a little earthquake okay and then back to and they play some whatever song right um plays a song uh comes back on after that song and then says, oh, actually, I guess, yeah, it was sort of a, uh, again, this, this is before we had cell phones, really, right? This is before we really had what we now know as the World Wide Web and all that kind of stuff. So um, actually, uh, I guess it was, it was kind of a big earthquake. It was, it was, it was sort of big. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll keep posted. I'm like, oh, okay. Still throw my pot. Plays another song. Comes on. Ah, I guess it was actually a pretty big earthquake because uh, I guess the Bay Bridge fell down. And I went, what? And all the other kids, what? And so, you know, abandoned my already screwed up uh, play, uh, 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 clay, clay pot, clay cereal bowl. And I blamed, of course, the earthquake, even though it was all me. I couldn't make the, the thing work for a damn. Um, and so ran home and we ran home to, to or biked home to, to get on, turn the television on and watch this unfolding crisis. So while it was true the Bay Bridge didn't exactly collapse, sections of it did. And uh, 
when we when we pause here, if you guys want me to tell you the story of uh, of karma, uh, of a crazy story about karma, I'm happy to tell you that happened to my family that relates to the uh, collapse of the upper deck of the Bay Bridge. Um, uh, emergency repairs ensued, and we um, we uh, uh, brought the ability for vehicles to travel across the Bay Bridge then pretty quickly, but that led to um, an, you know, two decades worth of reconstruction and, and new construction on the Bay Bridge, which ultimately uh, culminated in a completely abandoning this segment of the Bay Bridge. So there's a segment that goes from San Francisco to this island and then from this island to Oakland. Um, and the section that goes from the island to Oakland, which is the section that collapsed and that you're looking at right here, um, uh, was essentially completely abandoned. And we moved, um, uh, we built an entirely new um, structure uh, in its place, which is if you drive across the bridge now is what you're driving over. Um, this also leads to a lot of redevelopment and areas in, in the downtown waterfront area of San Francisco that leads to a huge economic renaissance and things of that nature. Okay, um, uh, nearing the end here, uh, uh, Northridge, 1994. Uh, so some of us were getting our umbilical cords wrapped around our necks. Uh, uh, others of us were doing other things. Um, I had just moved to LA to start grad school when this happened. This was Martin Luther King Day. Uh, so again, uh, the reason here, why, the reason so few fatalities here, because it was a Monday, because it was a holiday, because it happened early in the morning and just about everybody was asleep. Um, and, and again, not commuting, not on the big uh, uh, transportation thoroughfares. That's the primary reason why we don't see a much larger death count here. Um, but huge impacts, massive impacts. This is in Northridge in the Valley, San Fernando Valley. Um, uh, this completely nukes Cal State Northridge. Uh, they've put in all kinds of new buildings in the wake, so they're stronger for it because of this. But for many years, they were doing all their classes or almost all their, for example, biology classes in uh, temporary uh, 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 classrooms because so many of their buildings were, were damaged or uh, uh, unusable. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Right. So, so, so this also promotes a lot of. Uh, I, so, okay. One thing that I'll, I'll note um, before we talk about uh, Kobe is this notion that um, the general approach to uh, that, we, that we've seen. So, so if we go through our, our history so far of, of the uh, earthquakes through time, that we're, we're talking about different examples of. The first little bit is I don't know what's going on. Right. Humans have no idea what's going on. I can't figure this out. These are the gods getting angry. We move forward into modern times, and as we have these, these more modern infrastructure, et cetera, um, people are dying. And so the first uh, response of engineers is to figure out, is to do failure analysis and to say, hey, why did this bridge fall down? Why did this apartment building fall down or, or, or whatever, it's a dock or something? And so from that, the first wave of standards are about making structures survivable. So when things shake, uh, you know, it might shake and some stuff, your, your, your picture might fall off the wall, but the building doesn't totally collapse, right? So that after the shaking, you and your loved ones can exit the structure and get out and, and be safe. Um, and maybe it'll fall down in an aftershock or something, but, but you can survive the initial shaking. That was the initial focus of, of revised building standards, new ways of, new ways of, of uh, construction, et cetera. Uh, then, as we get into the modern era, where yes, so now these now these structures are more survival. And I should say, almost everything we take our lead from uh, historically have uh, taken the lead from Japan. And Japan is almost always much more advanced than we are in terms of earthquake safety and in terms of earthquake uh, construction. Uh, uh, okay, so, so so that's for the first thing: survivability. The next wave of of design improvements and, and building codes and standards and all this stuff is to uh, make the building survivable. So not just not, not make the building survive. So not just the, the occupants be able to survive, but actually the structure persists. Yes, it might need some paint. Yes, it might need some minor repairs. But the idea is that um, 
to avoid the loss of the billions of dollars, let's make the building robust. Let's make the structure able to survive and continuing to function, not just sort of survive and limp along for a few days while everybody gets out, but actually be able to adapt, to roll, to be more resistant and resilient to that threat. Um, and so, and so that, that's sort of the era that we are uh, in now is we're trying, we have a lot of old inventory of old buildings or, or existing housing stock or whatever that was built, you know, according to the codes 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, but, but the push now clearly is to not just make things survivable, but to make the building uh, uh, persist throughout a, um, a disaster, an earthquake. Um, okay, so the Kobe uh, earthquake of 1995, uh, uh, huge impacts. Most of the costs here, which is huge, uh, this was, I think, initially the most costly um, disaster uh, of its type when it when it happened. Um, uh, the, the big issue here was uh, uh, impacts to the port and the port has still never fully recovered. So just like we saw with Galveston, just like we saw with 1906 San Francisco, um, when you have these major economic centers and you have these earthquakes, it's still the case that you can have major dislocation of, of economic and social functioning, uh, even, even in the last few years. Okay, uh, Turkey, uh, 1999, this was a huge earthquake. Now. We have our San Andreas Fault, right? That goes basically north to south along the, the west coast of the state of California. Turkey has a very similar fault, very similar, except whereas ours goes roughly north to south here in the state of California, theirs goes east to west. The, 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 Turkey, the country of Turkey is, is oriented primarily uh, east-west. It's, it's, a, it's a wider country than it is tall, um, but, uh, very similar to what was going on with uh, us and what has gone on with the San Andreas Fault. And uh, what you see here is the consequence of corruption, the consequence of not rigorous uh, building standards. So my, my pre I was on sabbatical when the, when the um, pandemic started, but my, my previous sabbatical, I was in Turkey doing assessments of dams um, and in particular, looking at some of the failure, either the failures that had already started to happen in terms of cracks and also the potential ecological and social impacts of dam failures. Um, and much of that came from not bad design, quote unquote, of the, of the uh, dams, but rather really crappy, low quality construction by and large. And so <clears throat> what you see here on this picture on the right is you see this mosque, this really old mosque, right? Um, more or less persisted okay, right? So I'm sure there's some stuff damaged, uh, you know, inside things fell off the walls and stuff, but by and large, this structure was okay. By and large, these apartment complexes around the perimeter that you can see dead or, or, or crushed, you know, horrible uh, quality construction. And so we have both poor quality construction and poor oversight and poor quality control of the regulatory bodies, which essentially do not exist. It's a, it's a kleptocracy. It's, a, it's an authoritarian. It's unfortunately become uh, an authoritarian state. Um, and you can ask me about that more if you want to ask about my work in Turkey. But, but um, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's unfortunate. So this tells us that it wasn't just the shaking in this, for example, in this particular area, it wasn't just the shaking of this, right? Um, there is something about both the shaking and the, and the quality of the infrastructure that uh, were at play. And even though we had this very narrow minaret, for example, that you might consider a priori as something very vulnerable to shaking, it survived no problem. Uh, okay, uh, Parkfield, got to talk about Parkfield. So Parkfield is a very small, I mean, not, not a big earthquake in terms of anything. Uh, nobody died. However, this was notable uh, because, uh, for two things, one, because of our scientific investment and because of our short-sightedness. So Parkfield uh, um, is this place in California that because of the fault it lies on and, and everything, um, was having... Uh, 
earthquakes almost exactly every 22 years. Very regular, very regular. Now nobody's dying or whatever, but but check it out. So these are the previous earthquakes, right? So as we as we go through time, um, it's it's very consistently falling out. So the prediction was, hey, around 1993 or 1994, we're going to get another earthquake. So a bunch of National Science Foundation and and other other funding sources got together, and uh, you know because again, unlike the hurricanes coming in or or volcanoes or whatever, we don't have a great way to predict when the onset of an earthquake is going to happen. And so this seemed to be a case where, oh my gosh, it's happening with huge regularity. So let's get out there ahead of time. So in the late eighties, um, uh, you know, all this effort started coming together with all kinds of federal university, all these different researchers. And we stuck all these sensors in the ground to really, really strongly instrument um, this area so that we'll be able to look really, really accurately at what's going on. Um, I don't think I emphasize this enough, but um, yeah, sorry, this is, this is I, I'm, I'm going longer than I thought I would talk about this stuff, but um, uh, uh, because we've only recently had this theory of plate tectonics, right? Basically in my lifetime, um, longer than me, but, but you know, in effect, in, in, in practice and in, in, in textbooks and stuff, really only in, during my lifetime. We don't have this huge body of work, uh, uh, this huge body of theory, unfortunately. So we're, we're still learning. So very much so earthquake science, seismology is very much based in uh, two things. Uh, one is sort of the deep past. So geological um, uh, examination of structures and strata and old earthquakes and, and that kind of stuff. So to look at the long, the, the long history. And then um, uh, observations of the aftermath of these earthquakes that have happened. And then in recent years, we've actually been able to instrument these, uh, place instruments around places like California, et cetera, so that we can actually collect information as they're happening. The point is most of the field of seismology has, has grown up empirically. So looking at the phenomena. And so, only in recent decades have we really developed robust models that are trying to predict how, like that, that, that graphic I showed you, how the San Francisco earthquake propagated, the 1906 earthquake propagated around the uh, San Andreas Fault, et cetera. So Parkfield offered this fantastic opportunity to really, in a really detailed way, look at the shaking um, in, you know, in, in three dimensions and all this and that. So we put all these instruments out uh, in the, in the early 90s and people are waiting, people are waiting. And 1993 came, and 1994 came, and 1995 came, and 1996 came, and, and no earthquake, right? And these things are expensive to, to maintain and, and, and service and calibrate and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, 2000 came. And so essentially the funds dried up. And so we didn't have money to operate many of these sensors. So many of them were taken out. We did leave, thank God, some in the ground. And so while it was about a decade later than predicted, um, in 2004, we had this, this shaking. And so we still had, compared to a normal earthquake, it still was relatively heavily instrumented. And so uh, this led to a, a fantastic amount of information to help validate the theory and the models and, and, the, and the continuing to be developed models for how earthquakes propagate, et cetera. So this is a very important earthquake, not in terms of financial damage or people damage, but rather for the direct observation of earthquake and earthquake science. Sumatra, Indonesia, more about this later, but uh, this uh, induces this uh, uh, well-known um, tsunami uh, and, and kills a bunch of folks. Most of the folks are dying um, because of the tsunami and not the shaking. And those folks are in the immediate coastal zone. Um, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, almost done here. Uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti. So this is um, an example of, uh, now this is happening after Katrina, after the 2005 Katrina event. Haiti is the poorest country in the Western hemisphere. All kinds of issues with Challenging governance, bad governance, uh, uh, poverty, um, all, the, all the typical uh, things that we um, unfortunately can name so well. 
big, huge uh, earthquake to a country that had a very low capacity to respond. And so um, uh, all kinds of issues uh, come out from this. Sanitation is a huge one. One of the things that happens is the, uh, uh, the UN, uh, the um, uh, sort of international response folks, um, the UN comes in and I think it was Nepal, I can't remember, I think it was the, uh, folks, uh, some, some uh, uh, responders from Nepal, unfortunately brought cholera with them, cholera, a waterborne disease. Um, and leads to a huge outbreak of cholera um, in these camps that are already having a challenge with sanitation, et cetera. And um, long story short, uh, Haiti is still trying to figure out how to recover uh, to this day from this devastating earthquake. All kinds of philanthropy flooded in, but again, the challenge was, was huge. Uh, Christchurch in New Zealand, uh, this uh, was a series of earthquakes. Um, relatively few people died, um, uh, but it's it's become really, really uh, well studied, and it's uh, become a, a huge focus of the um, uh, exploration as to which buildings failed and which buildings didn't fail, and um, and is greatly informing a lot of the insurance industries rethinking or or. Uh, reaccounting for uh, costs from earthquakes. Again, another case of relatively few people died for the size of the um, damages, but but very expensive for the the relatively small damage. Uh, the this is the earthquake that uh, again, so another Japanese earthquake, shaking, shaking, shaking. Obviously, the earthquake itself had huge impacts, but the things we think more about are the associated knock-on effects of the tsunami, in particular, the taking out of the power for the uh, Fukushima Daiichi uh, reactor, or Fukushima, I think is how we're supposed to say it, although everybody, we always say uh, Fukushima, um, and, and then leading to the, the nuclear meltdown of the plant um, and the continued attempt of um, uh, TEPCO, the the power, the energy company, to deal with the cleanup, and we're still to this day having massive problems with. Um, we still have not removed the um, fuel rods. Uh, we still have not cleaned up the place, and it's continued to be a source of of problems. Um, uh, yeah. So okay. So so this earthquake uh, induces the tsunami. Um, okay. So. Uh, we're probably almost out of time. Um, maybe I'll just say a couple quick words. Maybe I'll just do a, one slide here of this. So just to, to wrap us up and I guess set us up for our next discussion about uh, our continuing discussion about earthquakes and tsunamis. How many earthquakes happen a year? What do you guys guess? You, you guys, Earth or worldwide, what do you guys say in terms of what are your guesses? Give me a couple guesses as to how many earthquakes happen across the planet each year. Five thousand. Five thousand. Okay, good. Anybody? Any other guesses? Three hundred. Ooh, three hundred. Okay. Any last ones? Drum roll. Um, over a million earthquakes happen each year. So our planet is very geologically active. The majority of these, the vast majority, are way too small for, for you or I to sense. But the fact remains that, that they, are, they are happening. Um, and we're seeing about, an, wow, why that, why that, why those words stop like that? Um, uh, so we're seeing a, an earthquake about every 30 seconds, even though, again, most of them are super small. Why is something's weird with my uh, slide here? Um, what the heck? What is going on with this? I don't, I don't know what's going on. Okay, something is something got weird with my uh, <laughs> my slide. Uh, anyway, so continuing on as if everything worked right. Uh, earthquakes are common, so uh, we get about one every thirty seconds. Um, most of them are in the shallow part of the uh, Earth, so they're in the crust and the upper mantle, on the order of less than. Uh, several hundred miles deep, and many of them are, are much shallower than that. 
Um, and so, so here we go. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just I'll leave you with this, and then we'll pick this up next time. But basically, um, uh, the as evidenced by you guys saying maybe it's five thousand, maybe it's three three hundred, we get to the question of did we feel it? Is it a big earthquake or whatever? And just like we have categories for things like hurricanes, we have categories for earthquakes. And so here we can see the the um, the rarest kind are these big, huge, you know, massive timblers. Um, uh, as we get into the um, large size, you know, we're talking about hundreds of year, uh, hundreds a year and can uh, feel it, but just a little kind of like, what was that? Like maybe you're watching TV or reading something and you're like, wait, what was that? Did, did my dog flop down next to me or was there something going on like that, that, that sort of size thing? We're on, on to the many thousands to tens of thousands. And then uh, again, the vast majority are not, um, are not uh, uh, sensible by you or me. So, okay. So that was a little bit about some of the, some, some of our uh, historic earthquakes that have some relevance to us in, in the disaster community. And um, uh, next time we'll uh, talk more, much more about the um, uh, uh, physics of earthquakes and, and how they actually work. Um, so cool. So with that, I think we will um, probably just call it right now since we're almost out of time. And I'm gonna wish everybody a good week and I will talk to everyone soon. Thanks you guys.